Welcome to the Baccio Lecture Series. I'm Dave Hoglum, the Director for Leadership for the France Center for Leadership, Entrepreneurship, and Innovation. The France Center strives to cultivate difference makers, ethical leaders who serve as a catalyst for transformation, entrepreneurs who lead and advance ventures, and innovators with the vision and skills to make their ideas a reality. The Baccio Lecture Series offers a forum for special guest speakers to share their ideas and experiences, discuss creation of new ventures, or reinvention of existing ones, as well as to help nurture a forward-looking, innovative, and confident mindset in our students, faculty, and staff, and community members. The Baccio Lecture Series is made possible through the generous support of alumnus and entrepreneur Fidel Baccio, class of 1964 and MBA, 1966. Fidel and his wife, Linda, have been strong supporters of the University of Portland, including the establishment of this lectureship, the extensive renovation of the Baccio Commons, and many other generous gifts. As CEO and co-founder of Bone Appetit Management Company, Fidel's leadership and vision have brought sweeping and positive changes to the entire spectrum of the food service industry. And it is with the same energy that infused Fidel's long association and commitment to the University of Portland. Would you please help me recognize Fidel Baccio for his generous support of this lecture series? And you please. Also, I'd like to take just a moment to recognize a couple people here tonight who had a lot to do with making this event and whole lecture series happen. One is our awesome leadership fellow, a graduate student named Lindsay Rodriguez, as well as Taylor Hendricks, who helped uh, bring Lou to campus. Would you please recognize both of those students as well? All right, so for the last 12 years, the Baccio Lecture Series have brought leading visionaries to campus to speak about their experiences. Tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing from Lou Raja. As an international speaker, Lou Raja's mission is to uplift, educate and inspire his audiences to live up to their greatness. Lou has motivated and challenged audiences worldwide to shake off disempowering beliefs and live up to their full human potential. Living by the global metaphor that life is a gift, Lou's message is built with gratitude as the foundation. Lou is the co-founder and executive director of EduCongo, a US-based nonprofit organization dedicated to providing funding and support for the schooling of underprivileged children of the Dometic a Democratic Republic of Congo. Before establishing EduCongo, Lou developed cultural specific curriculum and worked to improve health outcomes and reduce health disparities for African Americans in Oregon as a member of the African American Health Coalition. Would you please help me welcome Lou Raja? Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that warm and lengthy introduction. Um, it's truly an honor and a privilege to share with you tonight. And I'm beyond grateful that you're taking the time to engage in this conversation. I want to thank my main man, Taylor, and Lindsay for quarterbacking this entire event. And I also want to thank Dave for sharing a little bit of the leadership perspective here at University of Portland and prepping me a little bit as to what to expect. Um, in starting with gratitude, I always say thank you. And then I flip the switch so we can actually start the conversation. Is that all right? Can we go into it? Can we go into it? Yeah. All right, let's go. Jumbo, everyone. Jumbo. Yes, I have Swahili speakers in the room. That's fantastic. We've all seen The Lion King. This is good. This is good. My full name is Lukusa Badibanga Rajake Francois Benjamin Fariala Benoit Lou. Lou for short. <laughs> A hundred dollar for anyone that can repeat it. <laughs> it's always safe. I can do this all day. <laughs> I don't even have to have a hundred dollars. I can just say it <laughs> and it works. <laughs> um, yes, those crazy Africans, they give you too many names. 
And my parents are those awesome Africans who gave me those many names and could fit in the driver's license. So <clears throat> I got to stick with Lou. Awakening the Leader Within is all about the opportunity to unlock our potential as leaders, but perhaps more importantly, to help others reach their greatness. My father always says, when you take the elevator to the top, always send it back down for someone else. You are all in an amazing position to be students at the University of Portland. By the way, that word, student, is an amazing badge of honor that I hope you never lose years after you graduate. Because to be great at anything, you first must be a student. To be a leader, you first must be a student leader. To be a great entrepreneur, you first must be a student of entrepreneurship. To be a great parent, you gotta be a student of parenting. So that badge of honor of always improving and learning and challenging the status quo and always outperforming yesterday, every day, is something that I hope you carry with you no matter what, no matter what. And to give a little bit of perspective, I want to start with a unifying philosophy called technology. <laughs> Where's Mike when I need him? <clears throat> Ubuntu. Can I hear you say Ubuntu? No, 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 see, 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 I know it's been a long day. I know you've been through a lot of classes and all that, but you have to say it with soul. It has to come from your guts. Ubuntu. Ubuntu. Much better, fantastic. Thank you. Recognize anybody up there? Anybody want to share about anyone they see and why and how awesome they are? Come on. Yes. Okay, what about that crazy woman? Okay, thank you for sharing. Anybody else? Yes. Bob Marley. Yes, what about that guy? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, represented many of you know, the voiceless around the world. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. Wow, how powerful is that? I heard that when I was a kid, growing up in the Congo, and talking to my father of what that meant, and how power was really at the bottom, not at the top, and I could do something about it. Amazing. Anybody else? A couple more, and then we move on. Talk to me. Yes. Uh, Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. Yes. Martin Luther King tell us that everyone can be great because anyone can serve. You don't need a college degree, you don't need to understand the laws of relativity, you can't serve because you just have a heart. And the great Mahatma Gandhi, one of his inspiration, once told us that the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. One thing I love about University of Portland, not only do they help you in your future careers and give you the best resources, but they encourage you to go out and make a difference. They encourage you to make success something that goes from me to we. And that's what Ubuntu stands for. Ubuntu is a Zulu word from South Africa that speaks to the essence of being human. It says, my humanity is bound up in yours, for we can only be humans together. I am because we are. 
and there is an unbreakable umbilical cord that ties us all as human beings. Therefore, I cannot win or lose in isolation. What happens here at UP should matter to someone in the Democratic Republic of Congo. What happens in Syria should matter to someone in France. The connections of the human family is so interconnected and tight that we all have to keep everyone else in mind every time we make our decisions, big or small. That's what Ubuntu really means. Champions of Ubuntu include these faces. The great Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutus are among the best champions of Ubuntu. And Ubuntu says, I must see all in myself, and I might I must see myself in all to truly be human. In other words, what I'm talking to you right now, I am you and you are me. I don't want to sound woo, -woo but that's what it is. That's what it is. Oh, aren't they cute? Look at those two. <laughs> Quick story, background. My father came to the United States with the help of Presbyterian missionaries. He was in the Congo and had a chance to go to the College of Worcester in Ohio. From Congo to Worcester, Ohio. Small Amish town, fantastic liberal arts college, the Fighting Scots. My mom, the smarter of the two, <laughs> she got a scholarship in 68 that took her from Congo to Vassar College in New York. They both met here in the US that didn't know each other in the Congo because my mom came with a group of Congolese folks that included one of my dad's cousins. So my dad's cousins gets on a Greyhound bus, goes to Worcester, Ohio to visit my dad and brags about this foxy lady back in New York. So my dad decided to go visit him in New York and that's how they met. Went back to the Congo, had my two older sisters, and then they came back to America to further their education. And this time, uh, they're in Boston, Massachusetts. My older brother was born, and then I was born. And less than a year after I was born, we all moved back to the Congo. So by birth, my brother and I are the two Americans in a family of Congolese, which was always interesting. Because in the Congo, Every time there was political unrest, which was quite often, the United States Embassy will send out these letters, these alerts, get the hell out of the Congo, <laughs> and we'll receive those. They were great. <laughs> we felt special. <laughs> I literally walked up to my parents, I was like, hey, hey, if you guys don't get your act together, I'm going back to Uncle Sam. I don't, I don't have to put up with this stuff. <laughs> so this went on time and time again. But I didn't come back to the US until I was 17. And guess where I landed? Ashland, Oregon. From Congo to Ashland, Oregon. Are there any black people in here? What the? <laughs> That's what I felt like. It's like, what on earth is going on? And, and it's, 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 it was definitely an adjustment. Uh, but I got to tell you, uh, the first two years of my time in the US uh, were in Ashland. Fantastic, fantastic time. Again, Ubuntu, Ubuntu. Even though I didn't see people that looked like me on the outside, I saw everyone that looked like me on the inside, which made my experience amazing. No matter where I go, anytime I see a two-legged homo sapien, I'm home. <laughs> I'm home.
That's as simple as that. That's the Congo right in the middle, the yet to be Democratic Republic of Congo. How many people here have been to Africa? Raise your hand, please. Yes, I love it, I love it. How many people would like to one day go to Africa? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Beautiful continent, Africa rising. So many great things are happening on the ground, both in economics, entrepreneurship, as well as uh, democracy and other opportunities for civil society to rise. So it's exciting time for Africa, Africa rising. The years of Afro-pessimism are going down and being replaced by Afro-optimism. And we're pushing that agenda every chance we get to make sure that we are a global force in today's knowledge-based economy. <clears throat> These are the two real leaders of a house. My wife and I work for these people. <laughs> now, the jury is still out on this one right here. <laughs> that guy needs Jesus. <laughs> I, I don't know his story, so we don't know yet what's going on. <laughs> but his older brother, we're good, we're good. <laughs> In fact, I just got off the phone with my wife and, you know, she was being terrorized once again by that guy right there. <laughs> and uh, these two amazing individuals keep my wife and I super busy and we're blessed uh, to provide for them things that we didn't even experience in our own lives. <clears throat> this is my why. I'm going to share five principles with you tonight, and one of them will be having a why. I have the opportunity to make a difference and live my passion, and even monetize my passion. And this is the opportunity to not only build a school in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where we have over 2,034 kids from kindergarten to high school. And here in the US, having my own business and being of difference, working with the Rotary Club, working with the World Affairs Council, going back and forth between the Congo and Portland, Oregon, and seeing the same challenges, whether I'm there or here, but just couched differently. Beautiful back and forth between the two on both sides of the Atlantic. And here's always been my, my message is Africa gave me my roots, and America gave me my wings. Roots are who you are, wings are who you can become. Roots give you that sense of self, that sense of identity. Who are you, what are your values, what are you about? Wings, they stretch you, right? You gotta get outside of your comfort zone for anything great to happen in your life. You gotta be comfortable being uncomfortable. I'm speaking to you in English. I didn't know how to speak English. I was 17 years old. French, Swahili, Lingala, Chiluba. But I realized quickly that people <laughs> buy the messenger before they buy the message. So I had to make sure that my message was heard and therefore I had to learn one more tool so that I can communicate with you in the language that you are accustomed to. How many French speakers in here? Allez, on a des Français, deux, deux francophones. Y a qui d'autre? Y a personne d'autre? Y a deux? How many Swahili speakers? Okay, how many Lingala speakers? Right, right, right. <laughs> I think I'll stop. <laughs> uh, and being uncomfortable has been a key for any, any amount of success, small, large, that I've ever experienced, so I always push that. <clears throat> Invictus, Invictus, Nelson Mandela. If you wanna be a great leader, study leaders. Success leaves clues. Don't start reinventing any wheels out there. If someone has done what you are hoping to do, by all means, 
Go get inspiration, go get nuggets, go get techniques, go get strategies, and save yourself years of headaches and pain by following some of the success principles and strategies that they've already done. And Nelson Mandela is one of my heroes. So I took a pilgrimage to South Africa just so I can go in the prison cell where he was at Robben Island. 27 hours later, there I was on a little ferry boat going to this prison where he spent 18 of his 27 years. And to be in that cell, and you guys remember the movie Invictus, right? Uh, Matt Damon and uh, Morgan Freeman. To be in that cell and to, and to think about the fact that he invited his jailers to be honored guests when he became president of South Africa. What kind of a human being forgives at that level? How do they go from apartheid to the Truth and Reconciliation Act so that the country can air their dirty laundry and talked about all the atrocities and horrible things that happened and find a way to move forward. I believe we can learn from that. I believe we can learn from that. The ability to open up and share and then forgive. Here's the best thing about forgiveness. It's not altruistic. It's for survival's sake. Don't view forgiveness in some kind of woo-woo spiritual mind. No. It's for survival's sake. The more we are anti one another, the less secure all of us will be. That's, again, the other side of Ubuntu. 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 So it was an amazing opportunity, an amazing experience. Anybody know the poem, Invictus, by William Ernest Henley? Victorian poem back in the days? No? Well, read it. Uh, Google it. I can't, uh, let me see if I can remember some of it. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried out loud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears, looms but the horror of the shade and the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. That's a poem that Nelson Mandela read over and over and over and over in those dark nights. We were able to see what these guys did, him and his peers, down in the query. Their job was to just break rocks all day. Worse sun. They were having all kinds of long issues because of the dust and poor eyesight because of the sunlight. And there was a little, little tiny cave, little tiny cave, probably from here to that wall there. And that place they used for a little bit of shade and they used it to go to the bathroom. So the place stunk. And they quickly realized that the guards didn't like going over there because it stunk. And interestingly enough, 
they thought, hmm, let's use that place as a gathering opportunity for us to discuss the new South Africa. I mean, think about it. They even called it the first democratic parliament building. <laughs> I mean, think about it. The ability for a human being to go above all of the condition because of the human spirit and to see past any challenges to make something happen. What is your vision? What is your goal? And how are you going to leverage UP to get there? That's you, that's you, that's you, that's me. That's what that was about. <clears throat> those faces, those smiles are the reason I average 19, sometimes 20 hours a day. You will realize this really quickly as leaders. The need will always outweigh your efforts, all the time. <laughs> So you always have to have that extra reason to do something. Otherwise, you can quit at any point. It's too hard. It's way too hard. We built a school. We had 198 boys and girls. We raised more money, built more classrooms. Now, 2034. That's amazing, right? Hmm. Until you look outside and you see 8 million kids that can't go to school in a country of 74 million people. So the need is always greater, which means you and I have always have to do more than expected. Your paper is due on Friday. Turn it in on Wednesday. They ask you to write 10 pages, write 12. They ask you to show up at 8, show up at 7.30. That extra, it's not for them, it's for you. It's the kind of investment that will yield so much return later in your own life. Trust me on this one. <clears throat> these are our kids every day, motivated, because they don't have these kinds of opportunities. They just don't. And they run with it. Our goal is that we don't have to come all the way here to have something that should be a basic right to everyone, wherever they are. Okay. That's as simple as that. <clears throat> so we partner with a lot of great organizations here. Uh, we're working with Tufts to do a big project around technology. So we're bringing tablets to our schools so that kids can have self-directed learning to improve numeracy and, 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 and arithmetic and reading. <clears throat> Fantastic program. And then my favorite one is employment, from enrollment to employment. This is our entrepreneur business track that we started at our school in connection with the Congo Leadership Initiative. Why? Because the last mile when our kids graduate, we did a research and only 30% were able to afford college. And 25% of them were about you know, going towards, um, you know, the, uh, the equivalent of a community college or, or an institute. And then the rest were just hustling. So we thought, let's do a year-long business track, and this time we have a pilot of 30 students, 15 boys, 15 girls, and they get to have seed funding at the end of the business track year, and they can start their own businesses. It's an amazing opportunity. The kids are eating it up right now as we speak, and I'm on a plane two weeks from now, so I get to see it live. <sighs> you always have to have uh, your own personal inspiration in whatever you do. Um, mom passed away when I was four. I was the only dude that's left. And uh, I want to share something with you about <clears throat> Three years ago, my dad turned 70. Now here, it's not that big of a deal, but average lifespan where I'm from is 49 years of age. So 
So he's like a dinosaur, like 150 or something, <laughs> in real time. And I decided to go see him and just celebrate the fact that he's been awesome and all that stuff. And he wanted to go to Luebo. Luebo is a place in central Congo where he was born, a place he hadn't been in 53 years, a place I had never seen. So I said, hang on, Dad. I'm leaving Portland right now. I got to go with you. So we go. We fly to Kasai. And then we drive eight hours in a place that would have taken us here with good roads, like an hour. <laughs> um, no good roads, and we're going around. And we finally get to Luebo. And then we see the gentleman in the yellow shirt. That's my dad's fifth grade teacher. His name is Kankolongo, but out of respect, because he's an elder, you call him Papa Kankolongo. And the gentleman on the other side, who was almost just didn't even want to be in a picture because he, he felt like he wasn't worthy, is his brother. I took the picture. It's amazing when you see what your life should have or could have been like had it not been for those Presbyterian missionaries that took a chance on my father. My father is not smarter or greater than anybody over there. He just got lucky. It. This is not meritocracy. This is not some kind of a earned anything. Because the gentleman, Papa Kankolo, just didn't have the opportunity that my dad had. So here's the guy in the middle, my father, goes to the College of Worcester, UMass Amherst. Suffolk University, Michigan State University, doctorate, published 10 books, professor at the University of Lubumbashi for over 45 years. Why? Just because he had this, what you guys have. See, no matter where you go on this planet, everyone has a unique, organic brilliance. No one has a monopoly on intelligence. No one has a monopoly on greatness. That's everywhere. That's universal. You can be in Bangladesh. You can be in China. You can be in Brazil. You can be in the Congo. Brilliant people everywhere. You can be in Poland. But opportunity is just not universal. So it doesn't matter how great some people are. They will never have this chance. So then you, me, our job is to just provide platforms for them to dance. That's all. Our kids at our school, we don't do anything but provide tools. They already are brilliant. I say that to inspire you to Think beyond yourself and think about those that you can take with you to the top and send the elevator back down for those who missed it. In those kids, in that area, Luebo, that's the house where his teacher lives. I saw brilliant kids that would never have a shot. That's painful. That could be the cure for cancer, but we would never know. We would never know. Their names have never been registered. They're not on any computer. No one knows who they are. And when they pass, there's barely anybody around her car, if they have a car. See, that's, that's, that's the pain that sometimes you have to twist and turn into an opportunity to make a difference. Oh, 
house and get them. All right, that's the sad part of this talk. <laughs> Moving on. Let's talk. As I mentioned before, I only have five nuggets to share with you in terms of takeaway as you develop, as you continue, as you reignite that leadership within you. Are leaders born or made? <laughs> Both. Of course they're born. I've never met an unborn leader, have you? <laughs> of course. Of course they're born. That's a good place to start. Let's give birth to these leaders. But the second thing is the development of a leader. Sometimes it's by accident. Sometimes it's intentional. The oak tree is inside the acorn, but it takes development to come out. How do you intentionally develop as a leader? How do you leverage all of this, this launching pad called University of Portland? How do you leverage it to take you where you want to go? How do you develop? Let me tell you a story about a loser from India. <clears throat> he wanted to study law. And then, you know, of course, went to London to study law. Didn't do too well. Comes back to India to start his law practice. Again, didn't do too well. His brother takes pity on him, sends him to South Africa on a boat ticket. Maybe you'll be lucky there. He goes to South Africa, enters a train, and a police officer says, we don't have colored people in this first class. He says, no, 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 I'm a, I'm a lawyer, and, and here's my card, and here's everything. In the middle of the night, he's grabbed by the collar and tossed outside. And Gandhi's born. One incident, a leader's born. Now let me ask you, if we rewound the tape six months before that incident, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a journalist, and I go, hey, Gandhi, uh, do you think you have what it takes to free India? What do you think he would say? Hell no. Of course he would say no. He would say no. But yet, he did. So then what happened? Don't believe in any of your limitations. They're just stories. They're just stories. All of them. Stories. Oh, I'm not, I'm not good in front of people. Oh, I'm not a good salesperson. Oh, I don't look good. Oh, I don't do this. All stories. All of them. All of them. Made up stories. <laughs> if I was at a club in Argentina, uh, just cutting it up, and I saw a bouncer at the door, and I said, you know what? You look like you can be Pope Francis. He was a bouncer. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Wow! <laughs> Who knew? Makes you think differently next time you see a bouncer, huh? <laughs> you know what? I really, can I have your card? Let's keep in touch. <laughs> the point is, the trajectory of your leadership is in your hand. And don't let your biography determine your destiny. You, your decision your daily actions, your new habits, that's what's gonna make a difference. So here they are, five points. Number one, gratitude. Awaken the leader within starts with gratitude. I complained about my shoes until I met someone with no feet. Isn't that interesting? At that point, all of a sudden, things are great. You can complain about anything here and then think about the rest of the world and how they wish they could switch plates with you. In fact, 
because there's so many reality TV shows, I have an offer. I have a new one. It's called Country Swap. <laughs> it's a brilliant idea. I think I should pitch it to CN, you know, CNN or CNBC or NBC or ABC, somebody. Country Swap. Let's play the game. Let's have all of you go to the Congo for like 12 months. <laughs> And all of us come here, and then just see what happens. And then after that exercise, we're going to have a little interview and say, how do you now feel about America? Oh, greatest country on earth. <laughs> of course. It's called the law of contrast. When you juxtapose your experience with folks around you who have less, it gives you an impetus to do more with what you already have and appreciate it. Even in business, we use appreciative inquiry. Appreciative inquiry says one thing and one thing only, what's going well? Ask yourself that question every day and wait for an answer, because sometimes the brain will tell you nothing. <laughs> wait for an answer. What's going well? You'll be amazed how you're going to start rewiring your brain to scan for what works versus what does not, which makes you more appreciative. It's a lot easier to build on what works than to fix what's not. That's the appreciative mindset. Number two, revisit your why. In leadership, we train that when the why is strong, the how becomes easy. When the why is strong, the how becomes easy. Dr. King averaged 12 death threats a day. Real death threats a day. When Dr. King was on a plane, the pilot would come on the intercom and say, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to take a little longer. We have Dr. King on the plane, so the bomb squad has to check. Think about it. And he was a public figure. In other words, every time he kissed his daughters and son, that could be the last time. Every day. And every time he embraced his wife, that could be the last time. Who on earth would have all of those against him and still do what he did if they don't have a strong why? So you have to understand, what is your purpose? Why did you wake up this morning? Why did you wake up this morning? Why should we give a damn that you woke up this morning? What would happen if you didn't wake up this morning? Mark Twain says, two of the most important dates of your life, the day you were born and the day you find out why. Now, the first one is easy. We party every year. It's called a birthday. <laughs> the second one is tougher. I exist to uplift humanity's consciousness and to add value in the lives of others through my words, my thoughts, and my deeds. That's my why. So when Taylor is talking to me about the opportunity to share with you it's easy for me to say yes. Why? Because it's in alignment with what I believe. It's in alignment with my purpose. So there is congruency. And when you have a why, you get to use one of the most liberating word in the English language. You want to know what it is? It's called no. Isn't that a great word? No. If I may say it with me, no. No, no, say it with soul. No. no. <laughs> Brilliant. That's a beautiful word. Because if you have a purpose, any opportunity that comes to you, that becomes your filter. If it's in alignment, you say yes. If it's not, you say no. It's just that simple. That way you don't chase every shiny object. That way you can focus your energy on what you have deemed important. You. Not your parents. Trust me, 
The easiest thing you can be is yourself. The hardest thing you can be is someone else. Don't do things for others because you will fail long term. I promise you. Not for your teachers. Not for your peers. Not because you want to keep up with the Jones. Do it because it means something to you. And we will all benefit from it. So revisit your why. Know your purpose. Take time. Unplug from the matrix. And go hang out at the beach. Take a journal. Write. Ask questions. Relax. Meditate. Do yoga. I don't know what works for you. But take the time. Because the sooner you know your why, now you can leverage all the great staff that you have here, the great faculty that you have here, the great resources that you have here, the books. All of those things start working for you because you have a purpose. Look at a GPS system. A GPS is amazing. I mean, top technology communicating with satellite orbiting the Earth. Useless if you don't have an address. So it doesn't matter how great you are, how great I am, or how great UP is. It doesn't matter if we don't have a one. That's your job. No one can do it for you. Just like no one can do push-ups for me as I wish. But <clears throat> that's just the way life is. Number three, embrace change. <laughs> oh, that sounds so simple, but it's so hard. Embrace change. Only babies in wet diapers love change. It's true. I have kids. <laughs> And so think about it. Change can happen for you or to you. You choose. It's a mindset. And I got two more because I know I got to leave time for Q&A. I see Taylor looking at me. Um, <clears throat> embracing change is a key that not only will prepare you to be in front of it versus reacting to it. I play tennis, and I'm terrible at it but my younger brother is really good at it, so he beats me all the time. So one day I asked him, I said, Idris, what am I doing wrong? So he gives me a laundry list of all the things that I'm doing wrong, so I'm not gonna bore you with it, but I'm gonna give you one. He said, Lou, you're relying on your eyes to see the ball and hit it back. Yes, isn't that the point? <laughs> he says, yes or no. You have to study your opponent. You have to watch their moves. You have to watch how they wind the racket back so you can anticipate where the ball might go so you can buy yourself a fraction of a second, which can make the difference between hitting and missing. Anticipate change. What's happening outside of UP? What's happening in Portland? What are migrations and shifts that are happening? What's happening in the industry that you want to go in? What's happening in the US? What's happening in the world? Where will we look like 2050? All of these questions, you're supposed to already know, work on them right now, so that you can be nimble and agile, so you can actually leverage change as an asset, not a liability. Number four, and this is just going to be one sentence. Develop the extra mile philosophy. And this is really simple, and I'm going to give you one definition of success, and that's it. I'm going to move to the last one. <clears throat> success is what you do after you do what's expected of you. That's how you differentiate yourself. That is your competitive advantage. Do more than expected. If you stick to your job description, you are replaceable. Anybody can do it. That's a minimalist mindset. <laughs> if you do more than expected, you're planting more value not only to the company or to your group or to your team, but perhaps even more importantly in yourself. Lastly, and it's kind of tying back to Ubuntu, choose collaboration over competition. Choose collaboration over competition. I know we've been taught since third grade, since kindergarten to compete. I know it's in our DNA to compete, but I promise you, as we say in Africa, if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go with others. Trust me on this one. A team 
can take you much further and it's much more sustainable than for you to be superhuman and trying to do everything on your own. Your success does not have to come at the detriment of someone else. Work with others. And now, in closing, I would say evaluate yourself. Every 90 days, that's what I do, now you can have your own pace, but every quarter, check yourself on every goal you have as a leader, as a student, as a worker, as a business owner, I don't care what it is. Check yourself every 90 days. Evaluate yourself. Because contrary to popular belief, experience is not the best teacher. Only evaluated experience is. And I shared a golf story earlier, so I'm going to share that with you. <laughs> I play a little golf. I'm not good at it, but I play because it's a humbling sport. So, Red Tail, Beaverton, Shoals Ferry. I am practicing. I have a couple buckets of balls, and there I am. Hitting away. And Paul Travis, one of, the, one of the instructors there, comes and says, hey, Lou, do you mind if I put a camera here while you hit balls? I said, sure, puts a camera. About seven minutes later, he comes back and says, hey, Lou, do you mind if we go into my office for a second? I'm like, sure. <laughs> Drop the gloves, go into Paul Travis's office. And thanks to technology, I am on a split screen with Tiger Woods. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is called pain. <laughs> Lou Raja, Tiger Woods in slow motion. Address, wrong. Takeaway, wrong. Top of the swing, wrong. Down swing, wrong. Impact, wrong. Follow through, wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. And I've been doing it for four years. So you can suck for a long time. <laughs> the, point, the point is, for those four years, I wasn't practicing. I was reinforcing bad habits. How do you know if you're a good student? How do you know if you're a good leader? How do you know if you're a good brother or sister? How do you know? Check, evaluate, ask yourself over and over. How am I doing and how can I improve? How can I constantly improve and outperform yesterday? And so, a call to action. Please indulge me. And thank you, UP, and I appreciate this opportunity. So please repeat after me before we go into questions. This is an African call to action, so here we go. <clears throat> repeat after me, please. Let's take care of our children. Let's take care of our children. For they have a long way to go. Let's take care of our elders. For they have come a long way. Let's take care of all in between. <laughs> for we have to do all the work. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, UP. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Truly appreciate it. for your very inspiring presentation. I appreciate uh, it. We'll be doing Q&A right now, and we'll go for about 15 minutes. If anybody has any questions, please raise your hand, and we'll come to you with the mic. I don't. I was just wondering, did you ever get any better at golf? Did I do what? Did you get any better at golf? Thank you for asking. Yes! <laughs> okay. No, wait, 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 wait. <clears throat> Before the Paul Travis incident, I was averaging about 105. Pretty bad. I'm still bad, but I'm a 95. Hey, hey. 95, what, what? <laughs> Can't beat it, can't beat that, I'm pumped. <laughs>
talk. I have a real question though. Um, I was I was thinking you talked a little bit about uh, you know born leaders and then whether leaders are born or they're or they're nurtured and created. I just wanted to see you know what what do you think? Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Born yeah. versus like nature versus nurture. Absolutely. Um, you know the development of a leader is a constant thing. Earlier I mentioned to you that your best badge of honor is being a student. I grew up seeing what leadership was not to look like. We had a dictator by the name of Mobutu in my country. And then I had my father who was a servant leader, right? So I had a contrast, which one I wanted to become. And thank God for my father because he gave me an opportunity to study to be with him every day, to watch him, so that I was very intentional about my leadership development, how I connect with others, what matters to people, how do I get the best out of people. That's work. That's reading books. That's talking. That's getting evaluations. That's taking classes. That's getting certified. All of the necessary development that you have to do. And then, of course, practice. Practice actually leading. So because you know you can talk all you want, but until you have people that you work with that are getting a paycheck from you, that are dealing with real life challenges, that's when your leadership is really tested. Now here's the thing. I developed a six track module for leadership alone. And here it goes. Self leadership. That's the foundation of a leader. Don't ask me to follow you if you can't follow yourself. So the question was, forget everybody. Lou, can you lead you? Can the person in the mirror be disciplined enough to follow through on their own commitment? That's the foundation of a leader. And then leading others, that's the purpose of a leader. Leading change, that's a gift of a leader. Leading in times of crisis, that's the test of a leader. Leading together, that's the strength of a leader. And then building other leaders, that's the legacy of a leader. Now see, these are six tracks that I have to constantly think about where I am in each one and how I'm developing in each one, day in and day out. So it's a lot of nurture. I really could care less about the born because I, I didn't have anything to do with it, right? If I have certain genes, then that's not thanks to me. <laughs> so I don't even think about it. I just think about development because that's way more important. So with the concept of Ubuntu, do you believe that we naturally tend to go in that direction, or do you think that people need to be led toward the idea of Ubuntu, and what is the main reason that people don't just naturally yeah. act as a single humanity? Right, survival. That's my best answer. I mean, survival is our strongest instinct. You leave two dogs in your house, plenty of food, best friend. One bone left and you leave for two days and you come back, it might not be a pretty scene. Why? Because necessity got the best of them and survival got the best of them. It's pretty soon one is harming the other. So if you really think about it, I think human beings are wired for survival. So they will do it at any cost. So Ubuntu is a rewiring process because you have to think about it. See, there's an elephant and then there's an ant on top of the elephant. The ant is going east and the elephant is going west. Where's the ant going, right? The conscious mind is the ant, but your habits is the elephant. How do you retrain, rewire the iceberg, that stuff that's underneath you, all the files that you put since you were born all the way till now? So Ubuntu is a very deliberate process because to forgive someone, it's hard. It's super hard. So I had to literally work on it. And then Nelson Mandela says, not to forgive or to hold a grudge is like drinking poison and hoping that someone else dies. Makes no sense. So then you understand that forgiveness is something that liberates you, not necessarily for the other person. See, these are trainings. You got to work on it. So I don't believe it's our natural tendency, but I think it's our best ideal. Thank you. organization, um, assuming that you rely on volunteers, how do you motivate and inspire them 
to live out your mission, assuming, or as if like they were full like paid employees? Right, thank you for asking. It's all about matchmaking. E-harmony. No, but <laughs> it's all about matchmaking. Here's what I believe. Not everybody should work with us serving underprivileged children in the Congo. There are so many great, worthy causes. There are people fighting breast cancer. There are people fighting homelessness. There are people fighting the environmental degradation. There are people fighting for women's rights. It's beautiful. So all I do is present what we're doing and let it attract the very people that are already in alignment. I don't seek to convert anybody because they're already doing great things. They're volunteering at the kids' school. They're teaching little leagues. They're doing all kinds of amazing things out there. So you have to let it happen by attraction, not pursuit. Success is not something you pursue. Success is something you attract by the person you become. How did I learn this? I'm on a safari in South Africa. Three days, we're in a jeep looking for these amazing animals. We're driving around Kruger National Park. And it's beautiful, elephants, buffalo, zebras, great. On the fourth day, that night, we sat right in front of a waterfall. And we're having this beautiful dinner. And in three hours, we saw 80% of all the animals. See, the first three days, we were pursuing them. And it was tough. We saw a few. But the last, they came to us. So you have to become water <laughs> so that people come to you versus you chasing them. So in terms of volunteers, I present my best case. And that's all I got. And let the magic, let the attraction happen. So that's the mindset of volunteer. Because when a volunteer is there for the right reason, they run with you. But when you're making them feel what you feel, that's too much work. I don't have time for that. <clears throat> yes? What's the biggest difference in leadership styles that you've noticed between the US and the Congo? Leadership style, are you talking about the government? Or just in terms of people that you've come across who are good leaders in both countries, and what's the difference yeah. between the two? Um, the, 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 the stark difference is me versus we. See, America is very individualistic. See, America, you know, pull yourself by your bootstraps. I'm a self-made millionaire. It's not enough that our team won, but I'm the MVP. <laughs> you see, the mindset here is to celebrate the individuals. The mindset is, yo, know, that guy went from nothing to everything. That guy is a self-made billionaire. There is no such thing. There is no such thing. Show me a self-made billionaire, I will show you someone who's ungrateful for everybody that helped them. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> because you can't make it to the top by yourself. But this country is very self-driven. Congo, Africa, is very we-driven. All about solidarity, all about the others, all about the community. Here's my issue with both. I think they're both extreme. I think we should be in the middle. I believe that the individual is super important. It's not to be neglected or overlooked or under, uh, underappreciated or undermined in terms of human rights. But I also believe that you can't do it alone. You gotta, it's part of the same continuum from I to we. So clearly, a we mindset is very African. An I mindset, I mean, you've seen it all, right? iPad, iPhone, iCloud. <laughs> Everything is I. There's no we cloud, there's no we phone. It's just I, I, I. <laughs> That's the way we are. So I'm saying, can we fuse the two? That's why my mantra is be more beautiful. That's it, right there. That's my logo, that's my philosophy, that's my mantra. Be more is about you taking the elevator to the top. Give more, it's about you sending it back down for someone else. Be more, it's about I. Give more, it's about we. 
Be more is about success. Give more, it's about significance. Success without significance feels empty. Like you're gonna wake up and go, is this it? Is that all there is to it? Significance without success is not sustainable. I don't care how much you love the world. If you don't have means, there's not much you can do. So why don't we create a hybrid where we live both? That's the mindset, that's the main difference. Um, you told us about your why, but could you please elaborate on how you came about your why? Yes, thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, I've known my calling since early, probably 12, 13, <laughs> but I was scared. <laughs> Look, it's one thing to know your why, it's another to follow it. You know what I mean? You hear the voice. Most, in fact, I would even bet many of you already know. <laughs> but. Do you have the guts to follow your why? That's another question. So growing up in the Congo and seeing need and seeing people, I mean, I'm walking 45 minutes to school every day, if not more, and you can see coffins. One of the biggest business is making coffins. That's how real death was to many of us. Like you're walking to school with your little uniform and you're seeing coffins for sale all the way because it's a booming business, the business of death. So I saw the need growing up. So it's almost, it was easy for me to respond. So I've always known that I got to do something. That's why even when I went to PSU, I studied international development so I can focus on how to make change at a massive scale because I'm very impatient. I like, I like things to happen faster. So, but I was afraid. So I was afraid, so I just got a job for security reasons, so I could pay my rent and pay back the loans and do all that stuff. And then November 20th, 2006, I finally jumped and actually followed my why. And one of my mentor, Dion Jordan, helped me the strategy, help me with the strategic plan, help me with templates, because he was doing what I wanted to do. Success leaves clues. Find someone who's doing what you want and make that happen. But before that, it was just a matter of creating an umbrella that will motivate me and that will help me find a way to get there. So when I said, I exist to uplift humanity's consciousness and to add value in the lives of others through my words, my thoughts, and my deeds. I can do that as a speaker. I can do that as a coach. I can do that as a volunteer. I can do that as the executive director of Edu Congo. I can do it as a founder of Edu Congo. I can do it as a Rotarian. I can do it as a citizen. See, I am committed to the outcome, but I'm flexible with the approach. So you have a why that's big enough to motivate you and give you ideas in terms of channels of how to get there. I hope that makes sense. So you spoke earlier about following other leaders by example. Yes. Um, and I was wondering what kind of traits or leadership traits you try to emulate, emulate yourself as a leader. Thank you. Traits? Yeah. <laughs> or leadership style. Yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Covey said, seek first to understand before being understood. I have no agenda. When I find out someone else's agenda, I use my tools to be of service. So it's very much servant leadership. It's the pyramid that's upside down, and leaders are at the bottom launching others. How did I learn that? From my dad. My dad, my dad would, would cut grass with students, even though he was a high-ranking professor, getting paid $20 a, a month, $20. I remember one time we uh, had a lunch, lunch, family lunch with my mom, and that was my dad's entire salary, and he was so mad. So mad, like, what are we gonna do after that? Why did you guys do this? We thought it was an awesome thing because it was just a great restaurant downtown. And 
And that was his entire salary. I'll never forget this. We went from just amazing time to what the hell did we just do? Um, I saw my dad lead from the bottom. And, and when you follow the great Mahatma, like that's why I have all these people. These are mostly servant leaders, if you think about it. Most of these people, servant leaders. And that's the style that I gravitate towards. Uh, so it's really about understanding human needs, seeing where people are coming from, and leveraging it. And by the way, don't just be a Mother Teresa save the world. Make money, too. <laughs> you need success. You got loans to pay back. Make money. Who says goodwill and profit should be mutually exclusive? They're not. Become a millionaire. Become a billionaire. Why? So you can eat it all away. Right? Let significance be your why, and let success be your how. Let significance and, and your why use your heart, and then let your mind be the how. So get both. That's why it's called be more, give more. You cannot give from an empty cup. When you travel, what do they tell you? Put your own oxygen mask first before your kids. Isn't that terrible? They're like, the hell with your kid. Put your own oxygen mask. That's a message. It means you are useless to me if you don't take care of yourself. In other words, here's the new definition. Let me take care of me for you if you would please take care of you for me. That's a healthier approach. Yes. So you talked a lot about kind of cultural relativism and the difference of like if the United States and Congo switched. Yes. Like, so what was, what's kind of your stance on the people that don't ever want to leave the United States that are so comfortable in our society now that they don't want to leave and see the rest of the world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stay in the nice little cocoon, right? Stay in this perfect bubble. Success and your comfort zone. For you to grow, for you to really get a grasp of what's happening, not only in your own backyard, but around the world, you have to get uncomfortable. Do you know what it's like to apply for a job at Albertsons, and you speak no English, and you just came to America last week? It's very uncomfortable. How do you say paper or plastic? Oh, yeah, I got it, I got it. Paper, plastic. God forbid someone asks for something else. I have no plan for that. <laughs> I'm just like, that's all I, <laughs> but that's where growth happens. I ask every single American, every single person that thinks that this bubble that they're in is the best they can get, completely disagree. Get outside of your comfort zone, meet everyone you can, ask them questions. Be curious about the world. You end up winning way more, <laughs> way more than, be, than being isolated. So I always encourage, that's why we have a sister school with Lincoln High School. My school in the Congo, the Discovery School, and Lincoln High School are sister school. And so these kids, I, it's amazing, they get on Skype, and I'm just sitting there just watching, and they're just like, you know, some of the Lincoln High School students speak French, some of my students speak English. So it's great, they're sitting there and they're talking and everything from you know, what they like to eat to Justin Bieber. I, it's amazing, it's absolutely amazing. So yes, get out of your comfort zone. We've run out of time. Thank you everybody for your questions. And for being here today and joining us in this very inspirational presentation. I'm truly inspired, but I guess one of the reasons is because I spent eight hours with you today. <laughs> Yes, but thank you so much for being here. Uh, yeah, and thank you all for joining. Um, this presentation, obviously in particular, means a lot to me, um, as well as Lindsay and people from the business school, um, Brand Center. Uh, we all worked pretty hard to bring Lou here, and hopefully you guys have all picked up on the value that he can bring to all of us. So I hope that you guys um, really took away something um, of that value that 
I certainly did the first time I heard Lou speak over summer. So thank you guys for being here. And if we could get an awesome round of applause for Lou. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody, good night.